Okay. The webinar is now broadcasting. Hello, everyone. Oh, of course, now there we go. Welcome to the session. We're going to get started in a minute. I'm just going to let everyone start to filter in. But welcome to supporting teachers during distance learning with PD. We have a great session planned for you all today. Very excited. We have text director of e-learning, Joseph Sanfilippo here with us, Chrissy Rebert, our VP of Instructional Solutions, and then Steve, and he just taught me how to say his last name, Grease Hober, <laughs> right? Got it. Slightly botched, but Steve, I'm so sorry and thank you for appreciating, you know, the attempt. Um, all right. But yes, we are going to, at 12.03, we're going to get this going, but uh, if you're just joining us now, welcome to Supporting Teachers During Distance Learning with PD. Just, okay, it is 12.03. All right, welcome everyone to the session. We have, oh, nice, uh, 34 attendees in the room right now, and it is just growing, which is great. My name is Nina Sclafani. I am the Senior Event Coordinator for Tech. Welcome to the Tech Virtual Summit. Uh, you're joining us today for supporting teachers during distance learning with PD. Um, as you uh, enjoy the session, which is delivered by Joseph Sanfilippo, our Director of E-Learning, Chrissy Rebert, our uh, VP of Global Instructional Solutions, and Steve Grishober, the instructional technology coordinator of, and then how do I say that school district name? That's Apoquinimic School okay. District. We just <laughs> all call a, it. We all just call it Apo, just to be <laughs> short. <laughs> Steve, that is a doozy. Um, but as you are enjoying the session, if you scroll to the bottom of your screen, you will see there is a little section that says Q and A. Feel free to open that up and have that on your screen. If there are any questions that you have throughout the session, feel free to type your question into that. We're gonna do our best to answer the questions throughout, but we're also gonna leave a few minutes at the end um, of the session for our panelists to also address those questions. And also, if you see at the bottom of your screen, there is a box that says chat. Feel free to let us know where you are from and get a conversation going with your fellow attendees throughout, because we just wanna hear your thoughts, um, your concerns, all of the above. With that, I'm going to pass the baton over to Joseph Sanfilippo, uh, and let's get started. Hi, Joseph. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, just to reiterate, if you're using the chat box, um, you can change who you send it to. All panelists will come to the four of us. All panelists plus all attendees will be for everyone to see it. Uh, I'm going to quickly share my screen um, where we have a, a, a short presentation, but this is mostly going to be conversation based between Chrissy, Steve, and myself. So don't, don't worry about uh, really the amount of slides and things like that. So on the housekeeping tips, we are recording the session that you will receive a link along with proof of attendance later this week. Uh, so without that, I do have my screen shared out there. Um, and I'll just basically ask uh, Chrissy and Steve to go yeah. off and I'll man the chat box. Great. So go ahead and Joseph, go to the next slide for me, please. And thank you all again for attending the session with us. We really appreciate it. And of course, we have our special guest, Steve, here. So we're very grateful that he joined us today. We know that these have been unprecedented times and the landscape of education has changed so rapidly and significantly over the past few months. And Steve is here to talk about the challenges that this has brought, not only to him as administration, but also to the teachers that he's supporting and his team as well. He's going to talk about some of the strategies and best practices that he put in place that has helped him transition and his team to remote learning. And of course, he's going to talk about how PD played a vital role in this transition. Thank you, Joseph. So Steve, what would you say was the biggest professional learning challenge that you have seen so far since the transition to remote teaching and learning? All of it, um, <laughs> to be you honest, I mean, your biggest challenge? so, so our, our biggest challenge was the breakneck pace at which we had to get teachers um, up to speed. So we had had a one-to-one -one, um, deployment program in our district for a couple of years. Um, basically at this, 
when, when we closed down in March, um, all of our teachers in third grade through 12th grade had devices in their classrooms, um, but not all of them had been using them to their fullest capabilities. Um, and then all of our kindergarten through second grade classes um, were, were very minimal use um, with technology, but now all of a sudden everyone's having to use it. So we had to get teachers. See, we have a lot of Hmm. There is um, some something is not muted. Um, so if everyone just check your microphones and make sure that you're muted. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so a lot of it was just getting everyone up to speed and getting everyone comfortable. Um, that that in and of itself in a normal environment is a huge challenge and a huge task. Um, we were tasked with getting our entire staff, um, roughly 1,500 teachers comfortable with teaching with technology in about a week and a half um, and and not being able to see them to do it um, I am one of, of three people um, I have two phenomenal instructional tech coaches uh, Jesse McNulty and Kevin Wright who without them I say like our team is only as strong as our weakest link and I have a pretty strong team the the challenge though is you know we're not being able to see people. And, and how do you get all this information to them when they're not comfortable with technology in the first place? Um, so one of the biggest things we did was early on, I reached out to, to tech and I, and I knew the product existed. Uh, Chrissy and I had talked before about this, um, but it never kind of quite fit into what we needed. Um, this was an opportunity for us to be able to scale out. The three of us, Kevin, Jesse, and myself, we were not gonna be able to train 1,500 teachers remotely on how to teach remote in a week, a week and a half, even a month. Um, so this did allow us to do that. Um, but I mean, getting, getting that number of teachers up to speed on a huge variety of tools was probably the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge. And Joseph, go ahead and go to the next slide. And you kind of answered this a little bit for us, Steve. One of the strategies um, and the, probably the, the biggest thing that you needed to do to support your teachers was, like you said, train them on, on the technology that was needed to be successful in this transition to remote learning. And you, you utilize the Otis platform. Can you tell me a little bit about how you felt it supported your teachers um, throughout this transition? Yeah, so one of our biggest things that, and we always talk about it internally, is, is providing some choice, um, honoring those teachers where they're at and trying to move them along. Um, with anything, you know, one of the biggest challenges with professional development is understanding where people are and, and trying to personalize that the best you can. Um, we wouldn't have been able to provide that level of personalization without Otis. Um, for example, the learning management system that we use is Schoology. We were able to create playlists, and I jo know Joseph's going to go into this a little bit later, um, is, was able to create playlists where they were basically right there in front of our teachers, mm -hmm. but we could say, like, these are the three playlist we want you to go through. Now, obviously, if you already know how to use Schoology, you may not need to start with the 101 class. You can jump to the level two or the level three class. But these are, these are going to walk you through what you need to be able to do and, and allow that, the platform to do that, but also allow it to be done in a time and a place when it's most convenient for them. So for some teachers, it was in the middle of the day. For others who had family and, and kids, it might have been early in the morning or late at night but being able to give them the flexibility to meet their professional learning needs mm -hmm. when they felt it was best for them to ingest it. Because again, if we said, okay, right, everyone at four o'clock is gonna be on and we're gonna go over this and we're gonna do it live, that might not be what's best for certain people. They may be able to be there, but they may not be in a headspace in which they can absorb that information. Absolutely. So, so what, and Steve's talking about the playlist that you can create on the Otis platform, which Joseph is going to show you all these features live um, in just a few minutes, but the ability to create these playlists and drive your teachers to, to what you, what course content you want them to view and what's a priority within your district, as you said, is probably extremely important, especially when you're doing such a quick transition. Now, Steve, 
talk to me a little bit about the deployment process because having the playlist and being able to guide them to a specific courses, um, especially when there are over 800 courses on the platform, but how do you get them up on the platform? You said you had to do this, everybody's remote. So yeah. talk to me a little bit about the deployment process. And I know Joseph worked um, very yeah. closely with you on so that. Joe and I work pretty closely on that. Um, for, for us, it was, uh, we did two things. One, um, Kevin, Jesse, and I went through and we created our playlists. Um, some of the playlists were only three sessions long. Our Schoology playlist only had three sessions in it. Others were a little bit longer. And then, and then we started creating other playlists that teachers could go in and explore. Really, it was like, look, here, we've kind of vetted this content that we think this is good. To take that, like you said, 800 titles and narrow it down to something that's manageable for people to actually find what might be beneficial to them. Um, but then it was something that um, it, it was a kind of a pretty lengthy conversation, Joe, if you remember, we were, we were back and forth about, I didn't want um, my teachers to receive an email from Otis. I didn't want to, and what we ended up doing was just uploading a CSV file. There's lots of different options now, but at the time I literally sent Joe a CSV file of everyone's name and, and email address. And it got loaded in the system, but I didn't want them to get that email from Otis. I wanted them to get it from me because the email from Otis in the middle of this, where they don't know what it is, it gets deleted or it goes to spam or I get 500 emails saying, hey, is this junk? Um, so they were able to get a single email from me. It was pretty lengthy, um, lots of pictures, lots of arrows, like this is what it is, here's how you're gonna get in, this is what you're gonna do. Um, and honestly, Joe uploaded the users, I sent that email out, and within minutes of my email going out, we started seeing users in the platform do, going through courses, um, and it was amazing. By the end of that first night, we had hundreds of people had already gone through and done hours of content, um, which was pretty amazing, and, and it literally came from a detailed email. So that's fantastic. I'm so glad that the deployment process was smooth. And clearly, it, the Otis site is easy for the teachers to use. Within minutes, you had all those um, educators taking courses. And I know that that continued on. Would you talk a little bit about the analytics that provide you and how um, that helped what you did and how you supported the teachers? Yeah, so the analytics were important for us because as, as part of our shutdown, um, we had, so in Delaware, teachers are contracted by number of days and students are, um, have to go for a certain number of minutes. We have extra minutes built into our calendar so that when we would get uh, in the Northeast, you know, we get snowstorms and sometimes it closes schools. Um, but our students don't always have to make those days up because they have those banked hours. Um, but our teachers do because they, they're contracted for a certain number of days. So we had previous to this had started a, a program of, of snow hours where teachers could attend professional developments or other things and earn credit so that they didn't necessarily need to come in and make up those days um, because they were doing other stuff during the year. So we started offering snow hour opportunities during the two week shutdown before kids started doing remote learning so that they could not fall too far behind on their, on their number of days required. Mm -hmm. The analytics allowed us to easily just say, here, go in and pick. And then we were able to track the amount of time they put in and then be able to award them the credit for whatever hours. Um, the nice thing about Otis is it, it rounds everything up. I think, Joe, if you remind me, 15 minute intervals. Um, so yes. if, the, if the webinar is you know, 48 minutes, it gives them 60 minutes of time. If the webinar is 42 minutes, it gives them 45 minutes of time. So we were able just to be able to go through and do that. Um, and, you know, Jesse, bless his heart, was able to go through every, almost every week and update our internal systems that track how many hours they had. Um, and and it, it, it wasn't too bad for him to be able to go through almost 900 educators um, changes from week to week. So we had 1500 that we uploaded in the system. At any given week, he might be changing 900 different people's hours because of additional coursework that they had gone in and done. And Steve, when, when Otis was offered free during the, this pandemic, what, how many hours do you think the educators completed from the time of the March up until now? Do you think they completed the course? I, I, I don't know. I'd have to look. Um, 
thousands. Um, thousands. Yeah, I mean, I'll I can pull my thing open here in a second and and okay. just real quick look. Um, but it was it was tons of time. I mean, to the point when we've had some conversations about purchasing it moving forward. When I when I talk to people about the number of hours that educators have done, it, I mean, people's mouths just their jaws just drop, and then they're like, "Holy cow!" We never would have been able to offer that level of uh, of professional development um, without a tool like this. So that being said, and I was just going to ask you, what would you say is the overall feedback, both from you and your team, as well as from your teachers um, regarding the Otis platform and how it assisted them in transitioning to remote learning? I mean, it's been invaluable. Like we, we would not be where we are today without Otis. It, it just, we, we just would not be. Um, our teachers wouldn't have had the professional development that they needed. We wouldn't have, it, it just, yeah, we wouldn't be where we are. Well, thank you. And we really appreciate the partnership with you. I know Schoology was really important to you and you made some suggestions to our team when you were going through the courses and how did you think those suggestions were received? And was there anything that we tweaked to meet your needs? <laughs> um, yeah, totally. I, I just pulled up my Otis thing. I, we had, so from, from March until today, we've had 15,532 courses completed. That's fantastic. Um, so, I mean, it's just, I mean, and most of those courses are 45 minutes, roughly. Um, some, some are shorter, some are longer, but, you know, on average, it's about 45 minutes. I mean, you can do the math there. It's, it's amazing. Um, so we, we definitely early on had, had some things, and, and Chrissy, you know that I, yep. I'm, I'm always the one that's looking for how do we improve, how do we tweak, you know, that was good, but, you know, what can we do to make this better? What can we do to, to streamline this? Um, one of the things was just that onboarding process. Um, at the time, there, there wasn't a way to onboard them and delay the, the, the email. Um, there's other content that we saw that we were like, um, you know, that content needs to be changed or we need to add content around Zoom or we need to add content. And, and all of those things were done. I mean, there were, there, were, there were suggestions that Kevin or Jesse would email Joe about and like within a couple of days, all of a sudden it's like, oh, there, it's done. That's awesome. Um, and that's for, actually one of my favorite things about working with you guys <laughs> was, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about some of the features Steve talked about, like the automatic emails, the playlist things, they were just giving me like feedbacks, a gift. And I was like, oh, that is a good, a good feature to add. And I was just going right to the development team. And I think we, we did have a quick turnaround of some of that yeah. stuff and content. Yeah. One of the, one of the things was every time we added a course to a playlist, everyone on that scope got an email about it. So all of a sudden I had teachers that were getting eight and 10 emails because I added them to a playlist, the eight or 10 different playlists. And it was, you know, just, just simple things like that, that, um, you know, make the user experience just that much better. Well, we, we can't appreciate, uh, we appreciate and can't thank you enough for the partnership that you've created with us. And just to reiterate some of the things and the best practices and strategies that you put in place that were extremely important, and then I'm going to turn it over to Joseph, is one, having that partnership where we can go back and forth, you can make suggestions, and, and we value the suggestions that you make, because we will definitely, even with the course content, put um, suggestions onto our roadmap. Uh, the synchronous and asynchronous so that teachers have the ability to learn when it's going to fit their needs best, right? And the ability to access this um, from anywhere because in these times, we know everybody is going to be at home or remotely. The ability to create those playlists where you can drive your teachers to specific courses and course content that you want them to look at that will be in line with your goals and your initiatives. And then of course, um, ease of use and the deployment process is key because we want to make sure that the this is an easy experience, especially with all these changes and challenges that are going on during these times, that our teachers don't have one more thing that they have to learn. Um, and then most importantly is the analytics so that you can see that when you are putting all this effort out that they are truly taking the courses, they are learning um, what is important to you guys as administrators and the goals that you're putting initiatives that you want met within your district so I um, I was I wanted to add you. one other thing the, yeah, one of the one of the one of the parts that 
as we've moved from Otis being offered to us free because of the pandemic to, okay, here's how much it's going to cost. And, and us trying to figure out how does that fit into an already tight education budget yeah. um, and understanding the value. And one of the things is, is the ability for us to upload our own content. Um, because mm -hmm. the, one of the nice things about Otis for me in terms of the analytics is yep. I know that the, the user watched, had to watch the whole video because as they're, if they're playing a video and they click onto another screen or they minimize the window, the video pauses. There's no way for them to yeah. um, just click it and then do other stuff on their computer while it's playing. But for us to be able to upload our own content, we have a lot of trainings, you know, and we're looking at this right now because there's a lot of trainings that we have to do legally, um, sexual harassment trainings and things like that that we're supposed to do with our staff every single year. We normally do it during our opening day a whole staff, we put, you know, a thousand staff in the auditorium of one of our high schools and we do a whole staff opening day welcome, which really becomes a, a big production for us um, with lots of different things going on. But one of them is our HR director getting up and going over certain policies and procedures and updates that have to be done. And then we can kind of check that box off that says every staff's been trained. Being able to load that kind of content into Otis and then being able to see like, yep, everyone's done it. These are the people that still need to do it. And, and having confidence that that training has been delivered um, is important. And then also, as we look at our onboarding of our new teachers, we do a new teacher orientation, which is a week before the rest of our staff come back. But the problem is, is we're a growing district. We, I hire about 100 new teachers every year um, because of the fact that we're growing. We're, we're just south of Philadelphia, about an hour south of Philadelphia, and we're lots of old cornfields that have been turned into housing communities. Yeah. So we're constantly growing. I'm constantly building new schools. And the ability for us to onboard a teacher a week later, they don't get the same onboarding that the teachers got during new teacher orientation. We want to be able to level that playing field. And whether you're hired in the middle of August or you're hired on September 10th, we want to make sure that that onboarding process and the information you're given is the same. So being able to have playlists for new teachers and to be able to say, hey, you were hired at the beginning of July. You know what? Here's some things you can go through and get ahead during the summer instead of all of it being crammed up right before you yeah. get into your classroom and you're not really thinking clearly about all of these things because you're just worried about getting your classroom set up. So exactly. having that as a tool for that has been, again, it's a, you know, then we start thinking about budgets and it's like, okay, well, this almost takes the place of a person or has the ability to, to augment how some of this works and then looking at different departments budgets, you know, looking at HR, looking at the curriculum budget, looking at the technology budget, right? And being able to kind of source multiple funding sources to, to pay for it has been key for us. Thank you. That's fantastic. And we appreciate you adding that in. And so some of the things that I had just mentioned that were important to you, I mentioned because as Joseph goes live, I want him to make sure that he focuses on those particular areas. And then Steve, if there's anything additional as we're going through the platform that you want to add or that you think was really important to highlight, um, please feel free to do so. But at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Joseph and Steve. And go ahead, Joseph. I'll mute myself now. Sure. So I'm actually, and I'm just going to wait for this little screen to come up, come across the top because I need to be on this page. Um, you know, some of the things that I, I always like to point out, I think Steve covered them well, is that we're, we're here to work within your uh, protocol system and whatever it is. And that's why that conversation deployment is important because we don't want it to be, hey, just give teachers an email or, or give teachers an account and let them go free. We want to direct it to your school initiatives. We want to, you know, have conversations like, well, do you want them to have emails from us? Do you not want them to have emails from us? And that's actually some of the specific features that we've built in um, over the last couple of months with Steve's feedback that way, well, while we can do it for you without emails, you could do it yourself with and without emails now because that communication piece is important. And because Steve has a great team that was able to vet the content and speak with me and go through, I think it made that transition to here's something that you can use to learn as we uh, go into this remote learning phase very quickly. And, you know, it's not always needs to be, you know, I think we were very rushed and it was kind of like a, you know, running around with chickens and our heads cut off at that point, but it doesn't always need to be like that as so crazy. But the say, the process remains the same of meeting with, with the districts or the individual schools, what their needs are and what the plan to push it out, you know, not just throwing things out a wall, for example. So I am lo logged in. Um, 
And I did get a couple questions in here, and I know Matthew just asked the question uh, about School for a Death Staff. All of our courses are closed captioned. Um, you, you do get provided the caption, you know, embedded captioning, and I can show you as well with this transcript if you would like uh, for, you know, uh, as he mentioned, he works for a school for the deaf. And we do have other, other schools with similar situations. So all of our videos are captioned and all videos moving forward are captioned. If for any reason you ever come across a video that's not, you know, we might have missed it for whatever reason. There's an automatic process. We are, we're happy to caption that very quickly. We have about a 48 hour turnaround time with that. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. Uh, so I'm logged into the website right now. I'm actually logged into Steve's account. Uh, when you log in, you come to your dashboard. Now, just typical web website things. When I go to the dashboard as some overall analytics, things that I've registered for, what's upcoming, and then really like my progress because Otis works like Netflix where you have continue watching. So right here, if I view all of my progress, these are the courses that Steve might have accessed at one point and it says that he's 22% complete, 19% complete, and at 100%, it unlocks that quiz. So not only are you watching the video, maintaining it, it pauses and pauses when you go somewhere else and things like that. It also asks you questions pertaining to that course. Um, and that could be any course on the platform, either uploaded by us or uploaded by you and your district. Kind of staying in there, your achievements is straightforward. It's your, your certificates, but I'm gonna go to the playlists. This are the playlists that are recommended by the district or by um, you know tech, if you kind of come, we'll talk about the support where individuals can get recommendations, but these are the type of things. So for example, here's that Schoology playlist that Steve spoke about and Steve's watched the, the first two and he could go right to the third one. So it's a very simple interface to kind of drive teachers to directly to uh, this, this platform or to, to the courses that you, that you want. All of our courses are run at some type of live. So for example, the course already ran today, but on Monday, they're doing a session about Microsoft Translator. The next day is Google Science Jour Journal. And then social emotional learning for new teachers. So just really an overview of social emotional learning for maybe a new hire staff and things like that. So you see we have a kind of blend of variety there. But in the course library, everything is available. So I do suggest driving your teachers to specific initiatives. However, we wanna make sure that you are also giving them access to things you want. So for example, this, this the last few weeks, we've added 14 courses on digital accessibility. Now those are things like creating accessible presentations, um, testing website accessibility, accessible social media, alt text, video captioning, you know, things that as teachers go into that world, that digital world of having to create more digital content that makes their content more accessible for a variety of types of students with disabilities or even without disabilities using things like effective uh, translations or captions or formatting for digital accessibility, you know, benefits all end users. Every course itself, so I'll kind of go into the first one there, uh, is a video course, is chaptered. You can do something where you have teachers watch together, again, like a Netflix watch party where everyone gets that progress. And at the end, that quiz unlocks. There are files, resources, as well as discussion threads with all courses. Kind of sticking across the top here, the next area I'm gonna go into is skills. And these are all things that teachers have access to. So now while we have our full 20 minute, 30 minute, 45 minute courses, you might only want a really specific skill. So if I go into the Google skills and I wanna learn more about Google Docs, instead of a 30 minute video about Google Docs, here's a three minute video on how to create a Google Doc, or here's a one minute video on how to convert a Word document to a Google Doc. So I don't necessarily have to watch a full 30 minute session and get a certificate. I might be looking for a really specific individual skill. In our skills area, we've also added what we call techtivities. These are like mini cooking shows that go through student objectives, um, teacher materials, basically a lesson plan of teaching a piece of technology. So if I go into sixth to eighth grade and I look at presidential baseball cards, this is a four minute video that has standards based content in discussing how to create presidential baseball cards using Google Slides. But that includes the lesson example, so the actual uh, PDF or you know whatever you would need for that file to run the session, and the related courses that teach you how to actually use the technology. So kind of like a triangle of content to, to bring you all together. 
Now that's really what the teacher has access to besides our blog um, and things like that, which are fairly straightforward. But at any time the teacher needs support, there's Ask Otis. Ask Otis is where you can chat with one of our state certified educators, schedule a time to call you or email. We are also going to be adding a screen share option uh, if you're using Google Chrome. So you might saying, hey, like I'm trying to create a quiz in Google Forms. I watched the videos. I'm having a problem. Well, let's do a screen share and let's walk you through it. So even get more professional development on demand and being our staff is kind of trained to their one certified educator. So they know how to use technology in classroom. They're also provided information and trained about what your specific school district's initiatives are. So they may drive you to a place that's recommended by a person like Steve or his team. Um, I know that there's one question is how do you, if your district's not registered for Otis, feel free to email us at otis at teq.com. You can absolutely go to otis.teq.com to create a free basic account, but we'd absolutely help you out um, to see what steps you can take by either an individual, a full school district, or uh, individual school building. The last thing I'm going to look at is the admin section that Steve, that Steve was mentioning about some of the things like the analytics, like the ability to manage your users. Also integrations if you're using things like Clever, Classlink, um, or even LTI integrations with other LMSs. So I know Steve's district is a big Schoology district. So one option that we talked about, but we didn't do it for this spring, but maybe we do that for the fall, is integrating uh, Otis with Schoology. So just like other materials that you could share out via Schoology or Canvas, you could share out Otis videos directly into a Schoology group. So if you're already are using an LMS for teacher professional development, you don't have to to teach them a new a new platform you would just use our content and have them accessible in their already created professional learning ne networks or PLCs inside of Schoology or Canvas um, there's also Moodle integration if that's something you're using our analytics are very straightforward you see when teachers started courses by uh, right now it says courses completed that's when they completed them but if I can Put, uh, flip that drop down menu. I see what, what they've watched, what they've in progress, or so when they've started a course. And then, I, as Steve mentioned before, if I go, this is his district's analytics. If I go back from March until today, it says that about eight, 900 users have completed about 15, you know, over 15,000 courses. And I can also see what courses are com being completed. And if I really did this in that same time frame, because of that planning of what of the uh, driving to the school initiatives around Schoology and Google Apps for Education, you see those are the popular courses. So teachers aren't going off and just taking anything to take anything. They took what was prescribed by Steve and his team. Of course, this is all downloadable and exportable to fit into your systems as you needed, as Steve mentioned, as well as I can go over user overviews. I even have analytics based on specific playlists. So if I go down to my playlist area, here are the playlists that were created by the district and you know, kind of the conversation between, between us, sharing it out to teachers. But if I click the little analytics graph bar, so let's actually do the Schoology one. It pulls up, it kind of has everyone here, what they've completed, but I can export this by user or by course. So if I did require a teacher to complete X amount of courses for something like a new hire training, I don't need to comb and go through my analytics to pick that individual teacher. I could simply just export by those playlists that I created. Um, the last thing right here that I, that I don't have, we don't turned on right now is the my content area. That is what Steve mentioned about the ability to create your own content that is only seen by districts in your school, in your uh, users, teachers, in your district or your school building. You can create a category that has everything for high school teachers. You can have a category that's everything for your new hire teachers. You can have a category that's seen by everyone in the district. It does not matter. Um, and just to kind of, I see Matt just had another question. Uh, that yes, you can share school, a school administrator has the same rights as a district administrator just to share playlists within their school building. The other one is, does it mean teachers can upload videos from Otis before integrating into an LMS? So it's not necessarily that teachers upload the videos. It is meant for a professional development platform. So the, you can have teachers give teachers this right. Uh, they 
develop courses for other teachers to view that then can be pushed out to LMS. It's not meant to be used for like a teacher video for students. There are other great tools for that. This would be if you're using Schoology or Canvas for your professional learning communities, you can upload videos into Otis to get the analytic tracking ability and push them out to the LMS that you're integrated with, whether it be Schoology, Moodle, or Canvas. Um, of course, all of those type of things is what that deployment process uh, entails to making sure that we're effectively adding teachers, uh, effectively updating rosters, creating playlists, uh, driving teachers to specific account, to specific content, or even letting teachers know what they have access to and some training and overview of how to navigate and use the website. But then again, using that Ask Otis feature at any time to answer questions. Questions. Uh, and I know we were talking about like, how we kind of talked about licensing options. So there are single sign on rostering options, things like that you can roster through here. But one of the features that we added as, as request from Steve itself is the ability to uh, send an email or decide to turn off the email when you add accounts, share playlists, and things like that. But of course, as well as to customize that email. So you can customize that messaging to teachers or don't just make the accounts. They don't get a welcome email at all. And then you send it on your own. You always have those options. At uh, this point, we'd love to get some q and I'm just gonna kind of go through some of the open ones. Anyone can share a playlist as I mentioned. Um, you know, the teachers are your, your, who you designate as creators can upload content as teacher professional development. So it could be things that are specific to your school district. Um, you know, you might have things like, as Steve mentioned, sexual harassment training. We have a district that uses it where they recorded their nurse doing the EpiPen training. So then that nurse didn't have to travel from building to building to do the EpiPen, as well as technology training itself. Um, we have a district in New York that, you know, they had a teacher that was delivering a session on how they use Google drawings uh, in their classroom to have students do like mind maps and things like that. And they would do that at the superintendent's conference day for about 20 or 30 other teachers. Well, the district had 700 teachers in it. So they wanted all the teachers to have access to that great professional development that was done on superintendent conference day. So they recorded that teacher's thoughts, they put it out there and now all the teachers have access to it. So it doesn't necessarily need to be something that is part of technology, but it can be a technology professional development because every school or district has educators and they're doing wonderful things on how they use a tool in a specific use case or way. And there's a great way to put that out there and to let them share their ideas so everyone else in the school and the district can see it. So it could be things that are mandated. It could be even things on how to use your phone system or how to use your copy set center protocol. All things as a single location to provide professional development that's accountable because it's tractable in the tracking in the analytics that's meant for you. So either we create it or you create it, it's what you are trying to drive teachers to. So a mix of the two, I think is always best because we have a lot of great content, but educators can always create more content and then integrating with the systems that you're already using. Uh, otherwise, love any questions. So feel free to use the, oh, so I've seen another question that says, is my content exclusive to that district or can other districts see that content? So we do have the ability to open up that content with other districts. However, it's designed to be within your district. That's something that we, we do have in place where multiple schools can create or multiple districts uh, in New York, we have BOCES, which are regional centers, that the BOCES creates content only within districts associated with that BOCES. We could absolutely open up your content for other districts to see, but we would want that to make sure that you tell us who you wanna to share to, because you might be working with a, another local district within your state or next door, your neighboring district. Um, we don't make that native when you do that, but we do have the ability to turn that on. So I do think that's a great question. And uh, I know there were a couple questions. Uh, if you, there are ways to purchase Otis as an individual, or as a school or a district building, just email us at Otis O T I S at teq dot com with your school information. We'd be happy to share that. Lisa, one more question: Did you say we can join even if our district doesn't join? And how will it be beneficial to an individual teacher? 
Absolutely. So uh, an individual, an individual educator can have an account. There's a free account where you get any of our basic content as well as a paid complete license. So you would have access to all the content uh, that ask Otis to really ask questions to drive to what you need to learn if your district doesn't do that. And you also have the ability to buy individual courses. So if you know that next week I mentioned the course about how to use Microsoft Translator, if that's something that you wanted to attend or you wanted to view on your own time because everything's recorded, you would absolutely be able to do that. You just need to create a free basic account to initiate those purchases or purchase a full license that gives you access to all of the content. Joe, I will say that that cross district one, I'll probably be asking you to turn that on for me. I thought that was you. <laughs> I actually thought that was you that asked that, but I know it said anonymous. No, it's not, but it, yeah. it'll definitely be something that I'm going to be like, all right, other Brink districts, because we have a consortium of, of yeah. districts within Delaware that work together pretty closely. Like, you know, that'd be a, a perfect tool for us to be able to do that kind of stuff. Yeah, so it, ex exact, exactly. Uh, we, we, um, we're actually pu pushing out, and we'll, like, we'll tell you guys stuff that's coming. I guess it's always easy, right? Um, so, uh, other features that, that have been requested over the last few months, like I, I mentioned the screen share during uh, the Otis live chat. But another thing that we're putting together is districts or schools that upload their own content to be able to create their own certification or micro-credentialing tracks. You really call it whatever you want. Sometimes I call it certification, micro-credentials, another term for it, where you can take courses that you've uploaded as well as courses that tech has and put them into like the next step of playlists. So not just giving out a playlist, but making a track that you put assignments to that they have to watch all the courses and complete assignments that, that you review if you would want to do it that way to receive a kind of micro-credential about whatever it is. So maybe it is a, a new hire certification track. So that next evolution of cert, uh, of playlists and within that is is really the ability to then choose other districts that we turn on for you to kind of, hey, let's see who sees what. So we absolutely have the ability to do it now and a little bit of back end for us, but we're also giving you that ability to choose other districts that you want to share with. Of course, we would want you to have an agreement with that district or whatever it is. You know, Steve has a consortium of districts that he works with in Delaware, and that has been part of our conversations overall with a few of those districts of, well, they're doing great things in Apaho. They're doing uh, great things in Brandywine. They're doing great things in Colonial. How do they share that all together? Because Matt's at Christina, and he said that would be great, Steve. <laughs> Next door. <laughs> Um, so those are the type of things that we have on the horizon, as well as uh, this is actually, yeah, I think I could show this. It's on the platform right now. Um, we're also working with content for parents. Now, parents would have a little bit of a different ac access, uh, but so they wouldn't necessarily see all of the content. However, we do have a pathway to provide parent content. And then over the next month or two, we're going to be adding a ton of parent courses. And what that is, is based feedback from districts that have this remote learning platform of here are the top 10 needs for my parents. Now, it's not necessarily like how to talk to your students, your, your kids about digital citizenship, or, you know, how to evaluate apps. It's practical skills for parents. So right now, there is only a couple of videos in there. Um, we're doing them in Spanish and in English, but they're going to be mainly focused around Microsoft Canvas and Google Classroom. And really like an overview of what these uh, things are for parents, but then one to two minute videos on what a how do I how does my student turn an assignment in Canvas in Schoology in Google? So when that parent is has that question of like, well, this district is telling me I need to I need to know how to upload a video or send an attachment email or view my student's calendar in Google Calendar, my child's calendar. You know, we're gonna make videos alongside of that, and then the parent would only have access to parent content. So there's some. Other things that now I'm just like telling you we're well, working no, on. All right, Joe, here it comes. You yeah. ready? Yeah. Can I create content and put it in there for parents? Yes. Oh. <laughs> you just made my day. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you and that I will is, be talking a little is, bit. That is that is one of our things that you know yeah. we constantly are like, all right, we've we've rolled this out and teachers have worked with students, but we also need to train parents. I mean, with all of this remote learning, whether it's using your LMS, whether it's using the device that's being sent home you know, hot spots, whatever it is, like parents need to know it. Um, well, you're right, Steve, because I was just about to say, not only is it a challenge for teachers, for admin, right, but it's for the parents and the students as well. So we have to make sure that we're supporting everybody. 
So I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, so that, that that's something that we we've obviously had feedback from from districts. We've we've yeah. been toying with that idea for the last you know year, two years, stuff like that. We've always had some type of here's an overview how to use Google Meet. But then now that parents are really working with that remote learning, that like, you know, it all depends on what you do for a living of what what you have access to. But things like setting up your web camera, best practices of of joining a meeting. But then what is your tool? What is your tool that you're you're envisioning? And then again, that conversation between us and um, the district. So people like Steve, we're going to go like, you know, give us a list of the things that you're going to make for parents. We'll let you know what you already have. But then you might be, and Steve, I think you mentioned hotspots. You might be providing a particular hotspot, mm -hmm. you know, you recording a five minute video on how to use that hotspot. Now being in a central location with you know, you know, two minute, yeah, right? Five I've got, minutes no, I've, got two di I've got two different models of hotspots. Oh, yeah, two different models so, of hotspots. Depending upon whether it's an AT&T or a Verizon hotspot determines what you have to do. So and it's all in that single videos. location. And again, you're, you would use Otis's analytics to see if parents are accessing the courses. So, you know, one thing we'd say is I understand it's a check box, but six months down the line, oh, I had a my parents complain, I had a bad experience. Well, I see that you, we provided all this for you and I could see that you never used it. You know, you don't wanna be in that situation, but that gives you that, that ability. Um, you know, and we're, we're, we're working heavily right now on uh, particularly Google, Google apps for parents, um, overviews, simple things how to use, just so if their child has a question for them, they can kind of show them, uh, as well as Canvas. And then the next round will be Schoology and Microsoft. However, we are always willing to take more suggestions of general tech things like how to reset your Wi-Fi, how to attach how to attach an email to Outlook, to you know Google, Google whatever you're, you're using. Um, and then you know more particularly, so we have a district that is uh, using Raz Kids. And that, that district, we worked with them, they created a series of videos on how elementary school parents log into Raz Kids and access the content that's being pushed out by you know their two minute videos, three minute videos. They're not a lot of work, but it's very powerful going, hey, this is where you can go get questions. Of course, a big thing in particular is if there's some kind of tech support ticket that that parent can put in as well, that's something that they should uh, have documentation or be able to learn how to use it as well. Um, so just all, always those kind of things. You had another question that you posted. You wanna go ahead and ask it to Joseph while you're- I, I, do, I do see it. Um, so, we are currently, and I'll, I'll kind of go, um, I have the course library up still. I didn't want to put him on the spot publicly if he wasn't going to be able to answer it, so. Uh, I'm, I, I'm pretty good at just making right. things up as I go along. No, I'm going to <laughs> type. Uh, so Spanish, so we do have everything closed captioned for. Mm -hmm. We do have courses that are aligned by the ISTE standards that have been uh, approved by uh, you know, the ISTE's committee. And we are you know, approved for teacher readiness and profic proficiency, so you can find those. We also have a series of Spanish courses. We've, right now- Joe, hold on, hold on a sec. So just so everyone who's listening understands, I asked him the question if there was any thoughts for auto translating videos in other languages because I saw that the few that were being recorded in both English and Spanish and the closed captioning accessibility question earlier, you know, we have a large number of parents that don't speak English. So how do we provide um, training to parents, but also keep in mind all the different languages that parents need? Yeah, so it, it, exactly. We're, we're, that's part of what we would work with, with districts to make sure we're providing the content in the right ways. We have the capability because uh, we have trainers that are proficient, uh, multiple trainers are proficient as Spanish speakers in variety of Spanish dialects as well. So we have started that in the doing all of our Microsoft content uh, in teachers in Spanish and English as well as Google. And then we are going to then split up doing the kind of parent content that we push out as well in Spanish and English. However, if there are other languages, um, we could always help you up upload uh, courses in other languages. And then we have not gotten to it yet, but we are going to look into um, captioning in other languages as well. Um, there are some tools that'll do that for you automatically. Um, that's something that we're exploring at at the current moment. Um, Spanish is the, the largest request that we get, so that's where we started with. However, um, we are not against working with any districts that might have another population and have a native speaker that we might not have uh, to work on uploading your own content in those particular languages. Uh, we are working with New York City Department of Education who is, makes videos where it's in English. However, when they create captions and overlay, uh, they choose up to six different languages on the bottom as well. 
All right, guys. And so we're just about winding down. Um, before we leave, could you all tell the audience where they could find you for, you know, reach out for questions or any extra info? Right. Sure. I mean, you, you can find you can find any of us. Uh, you know, I, I know that our, our emails were in the invite. Um, Chrissy and myself, I'll, I'll type our emails into the chat box as well as Otis, O-T-I-S at T-E-Q.com. And if you two want to add. I'll, I'll put my my email in the chat box as well. Um, it is probably the, the easiest way to get a hold. And just so everyone knows, we are going to have this available as a video. Uh, we're going to be sending those out to all of you within the week. So if you want to review any of this, feel free. If you want to share it with a colleague, it will be available. Perfect. Thank you, Joseph, for doing that. No problem. No problem. And I, I would have typed Steve's, but it's I can pronounce his last name. I definitely can't spell it. <laughs> And, and if you notice in the email, we don't say apoquinamic. We even shorten that. Yeah. <laughs> as, a, as a person from Long Island, Native American town names are easy to pronounce. Speak for yourself. <laughs> well, <laughs> anyway. I, I just want to say thank you, Steve, for joining us today. We really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Steve. I'm sure we'll all talk you, soon. Mom. Yeah. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great one. Thank you. Bye.